So 17 years ago, which feels really weird, I graduated from college. Now I went to a, a, a college in Tacoma, Washington called Bates Technical College. It was a trade school. And I went uh, to really follow in my father's footsteps. I wanted to become, like he was, a firefighter. And so I enrolled in this uh, fire service program they had in which I would learn, earn my associate's degree. And in this, this program, it was really cool. We got to do basically everything that a firefighter would do that was non-medical. We would get to do all the cool stuff. We'd have our own engines that we ran and, and just, uh, it was a blast. But one of my, fu the funnest things that we did, the one that I really liked maybe the most was this confined spaces trailer. Uh, and there's a lot of different versions of this if you're familiar with it. But what it is, is this about 25 foot long trailer uh, that you practice navigating through a maze. And so this one had this, this steel cage inside of the trailer that actually you could uh, arrange however you want. And it was these small uh, steel cages within the cage. It was about three levels high and, and really long. And you would have to go through it. Uh, and, it and, and it had openings on the top, the left, the right. And, and, then, and, it, and in these openings, some of them would be uh, sealed halfway or they'd be sealed diagonal. So you would have to squeeze through. And after getting an opportunity to do it a couple of times uh, with the lights on and just in your, in your clothes, you would work up to where the lights would go off. Maybe they'd fill the room with smoke and you would be wearing all of your gear. You'd have your bunker gear on. That's the, the big fire gear they have with the boots and the helmet and the gloves. <clears throat> and then you would also have your SCBA, the pack, the oxygen pack, and actually the mask on itself. You would be breathing through the mask. And you would have to navigate through this maze in pitch black. You would have to feel your way through while you're breathing. And it was to practice simulating uh, a house fire with some collapsed structure. It's really cool. And I, I was really great at it. Uh, I, I'm not a particularly big guy, and I was even less of a big guy back then, about 5'9", 130 pounds. And I would just fly through this. Even with my gear on, I would have to sometimes take off my pack to squeeze through the really small holes, but I would, I would fly through it, no problem. And I don't get claustrophobic. I get claustrophobic, weirdly enough, when I sleep, but nowhere else. So it was just awesome. I would crush it. We'd have competitions that I would win. Uh, but that wasn't true for all the guys. Some of the guys, they were big guys. They were really big guys. And I remember every time we would go through this trailer, inevitably several guys would get stuck. Uh, and I really remember specifically the first time I watched this happen. It was one of the guys who had been in the class longer than I had. He's going through, he's a big dude. He's going through this maze and he gets to this point where you have to come out and then you turn up and you go through this, this half, of a, half of a section and then you kind of go back over the top of yourself. And as he's going in, pitch black smoke, he misses the fact that half of it's cut off. Half of it is sealed. So it's an even smaller space. And he gets up and around and his body gets stuck. His oxygen tank gets stuck and he, he's fully stuck. And he just panics. He panics. He starts shaking the cage. He starts really, starts shaking the trailer. He's screaming, get me out of here. At one point, he rips his mask off. He's so <laughs> overcome with this feeling of panic. And fortunately, the design of the trailer, you can open the sides and you can come in and you can pull apart the maze really simply. And, and he gets out. It, it only takes about maybe 30 seconds for him to get out. But in that moment, like he has just this overwhelming sense of claustrophobia, this terror. And the only thing he's concerned about is to get free. And this desire for freedom that he was experienced is a desire that I think a lot of us, uh, all of us at some point, uh, desire again and again in through life. Sometimes it's really that physical desire of freedom like he had, but often it's, it's connected to the other thing, a desire for freedom maybe financially or freedom from uh, some authority figure over you. <laughs> But the one that we all wrestle with at some point is this desire for freedom uh, from the guilt, the shame, the condemnation of sin. And so what do we do? How do we, how are we freed from this? How are we freed from really bondage to sin? <laughs> and today we're looking at Exodus 11 through 12. We're continuing our series, This Is Our God. And we're going to be looking at the 10th and final plague and the festivals that uh, God institutes going along with it. And we're going to see how God, how God gives the Israelites freedom. And so up to this point, we've seen the nine plagues and God is going to come to Moses and he's going to tell him about this 10th plague. He says, the Lord said to Moses, yet one plague more I will bring upon Pharaoh and upon Egypt. Afterward, he will let you go from here. When he lets you go, 
he will drive you away completely. So God speaks to Moses and tells him the time has finally come. And put yourself in the shoes of Moses for a second. Uh, depending on which scholar, some believe it's as short as four months, but most likely this is about a, a nine-month period up to here that Moses has been obedient and faithful to God and has watched these plagues, a the plagues that eventually will mean that the Israelites get to go free from Egypt. But now he, he, each one comes, there's got to be sitting in the back of the mind, is this the final plague? Is this the one that is finally going to grant Israel its freedom? And God, before the 10th plague, comes to Moses and said, this is it. What I have promised, the promise that he really made 400 and about 30 years prior to this, is going to be true finally. They are going to get their freedom. They are going to continue on to their journey of the promised land. And he's going to deliver this plague. And at the end of it, Pharaoh's not just going to let them go. He's going he's to just say to them, get out, go from me, be free, go to your God, get out of my country. And he also says to Moses, speak now in the hearing of the people, that is to the people of Israel, that they ask every man of his neighbor and every woman of her neighbor for silver and gold jewelry. He's keeping the promise he made when he reveals himself to Moses that before you leave, the Israels to go amongst the Egyptians and take their gold and silver, not rob it from them, but simply ask and they will receive. What has happened is God is revealing his power through the plagues. He is gaining favor for the people of Israel, for Moses, ultimately for himself, so that they just hand over all of these riches to Israel. And what's, what's been going on, of course, is God is waging this war against Egypt and the gods of Egypt. And this is almost the spoils of war. It says they plunder Egypt, but God is the one fighting the battle and Israel benefits from it financially as they leave. <laughs> and so Moses, he ends up in front of Pharaoh and he's gonna reveal the coming of the 10th plague. And he's, he's going to rebuild. He's not going to give Pharaoh a choice. Pharaoh doesn't get the choice to, to, to relent, to prevent this plague. But he is going to tell him what is to come. He says, thus says the Lord, about midnight I will go out in the midst of Egypt and every firstborn in the land of Egypt shall die. From the firstborn of Pharaoh who sits on his throne, even to the firstborn of the slave girl who is behind the handmill, and all the firstborn of the cattle, there shall be a great cry throughout all the land of Egypt, such as there has never been, nor ever will be again. But not a dog shall growl against any of the people of Israel, either man or beast, that you may know that the Lord makes a distinction between Egypt and Israel. God reveals through Moses to Pharaoh that the 10th plague is coming and is going to be the most devastating of all. Even though up to this point, yeah, as the Egyptians recognize Egypt itself is destroyed, there's one that's going to cost them even greater. He's going to take and kill the firstborn of every household and the firstborn of all the animals. And he's going to do this only to Egypt. Israel will not suffer under this judgment. He's going to, again, make the distinction. Israel is his holy people. His, his, his people, what well, Egypt is not, and they will suffer the judgment as they do not turn to God. And this plague, like all the other ones, he's still doing battle. He's still doing battle with the gods of Egypt. One, again, he's done battle with seemingly multiple times, is Isis, this goddess who protects children and say, you can't prevent this one from taking the lives of some of the children. But he's really uh, primarily seeming to do battle with Pharaoh. Again, he's a god. Pharaoh is a god in the flesh of Egypt. He is, is worshipped, he's exalted, and, and God is saying, I can take even from you, the people of your empire, that you cannot protect them. And beyond that is he kills the firstborn, which would be Pharaoh's son, the heir to the throne, who is himself either Ra in the flesh or descendant of Ra, saying, uh, this child that is supposed to be a god cannot stand in the face of the one true God, Yahweh. <laughs> And this plague, unlike all the other plagues, the nine previous plagues that God has given to Moses and to the Israelites, uh, previously they didn't have any real role in them. Yes, Moses had to go in front of Pharaoh and they cast down the staff. But really, uh, Israel kind of just sat and watched. But this one is going to be different. This one, Israel is given a command. They're giving something that they have to do before this plague happens. And so 
<laughs> God delivers this message to Moses and Aaron, who then relay it to Israel. He says, this month shall be for you in the beginning of months. It shall be the first month of the year for you. Tell all the congregation of Israel that on the 10th day of this month, every man shall take a lamb according to their father's houses and lamb for a household. And if the household is too small for a lamb, then he and his nearest neighbor shall take according to the number of persons. According to what each can eat, you shall make your count for the lamb. Your lamb shall be without blemish, a male a year old. You may take it from the sheep or from the goats, and you shall keep it until the 14th day of this month. <coughs> when the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill their lambs at twilight. Then they shall take some of the blood and put it on the two tor posts and the lintel of the houses in which they eat it. And the lintel is simply uh, the cross, what we would call the cross beam of the door frame. And they shall eat the flesh that night. Roasted on the fire with unleavened bread and bitter herbs, they shall eat. Do not eat any of it raw or boiled in water, but roasted its head with its legs and its inner parts. <clears throat> and you shall let none of it remain until the morning. Anything that remains until the morning you shall burn. In this manner you shall eat it with your belt fastened, your sandals on your feet, and your staff in your hand. And you shall eat it in haste. It is the Lord's Passover. For I will pass through the land of Egypt that night, and I will strike all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast. And on all the gods of Egypt, I will execute judgments. I am the Lord. The blood shall be a sign for you on the houses where you are. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you. And no plague will befall you to destroy you when I strike the land of Egypt. <laughs> so God tells the Israelites what's going to happen in their role. That the firstborn in all the land is going to be slain. Uh, but Israel's firstborns, are going to remain under harm. But their job, that what they are to do is sacrifice a lamb, a specific lamb, uh, uh, the unmarred lamb uh, uh, without defect. And they're to take the blood of it as they eat it and they're to, to paint their, the, the blood onto the door frame of their houses so that God would pass over it, hence the name Passover. And what's interesting is it's not that God needs the blood uh, to identify the house. He's God who knows all, sees all. He doesn't need this as some real sign. Uh, he knows exactly who the Egyptians are and who the Israel. It is a symbolic gesture. They're painting the blood around there as kind of this atoning sacrifice, that the sacrifice of the lamb pays the price. They no longer will suffer the judgment that all the people of the lands will suffer, but Egypt will suffer judgment. And, and, and this, this, all these actions, they're really kind of pointing the way to something greater. And we'll come back to this, but he's pointing the way to Jesus. All of these actions, they don't know it at the time. They're simply getting freedom from Egypt, are pointing to Jesus and the freedom that we get from sin. But in the midst of this, this, this plague, there often comes a question and a wrestling for people. It's a wrestling that I, many people I know have had to walk through that really is a test of faith. And it's a, it's a wrestling uh, that I see a lot in my generation, Gen Z. And it, it really goes around this question. Are you willing to follow a God who kills? Because what I see this question turn into and really pushes non-believers sometimes away is if God is good and he kills, is he really a good God? And am I really willing to follow a God who kills? And it's a question I want to say that we all, at some level, I have to wrestle with. Sometimes it's a really a deep one that we just have to, am I, is this, am I okay with this? Like, can I even manage this? For myself, this is not a question that really created this internal conflict, but that's not true for everyone. Some people, this is this one they have to struggle with for years and years. And if you're this got person struggling or like myself, who's this not a, not a big, not a huge deal. I still think we have to wrestle with it because we don't get to pick and choose who God is. We don't get to say, I like this part and not this part and I'll toss these to the side and, and this is my picture of God, not this. We have to take the entirety of God and everything he's done and choose, are we going to follow him knowing everything about him? <laughs> and if this is something you're really wrestling, I would, I would highly recommend you, you come speak with the pastor if you would like some help. But I do want to, to put out some things there to kind of help you process through this. And the first thing really goes back what we've been looking at. Who is our God? Who is Yahweh? In the first week, we looked at this idea that God is sovereign, which means he has authority over all things, all creation, which is 
everything that he, everything in existence, he brought forth. He has authority all, over all of it, including mankind and including mankind's life and death. It is for him alone to have power over. And <coughs> beyond that, he is, though we haven't covered it, he is a God of justice. He is a God of justice. He demands justice. And so he says through scripture that the wages of sin is death because of sin, including idolatry and, and, and the pain inflicted on Israel, that Egypt and really all people for all time are deserving of death. We don't understand fully why, but that is how God has created everything, that because of sin, death has entered the world, and that because of our sin, we are deserving of that, and we are deserving of spiritual death, separation from God. <laughs> and so Egypt being a, a, a wicked nation, a nation that idolizes all these false gods who, who, who does evil, particularly Pharaoh, they're deserving of death. And so God being a God of sovereignty, being a God of justice, he demands justice. He, demand, he, he has the ability to be the perfect judge and he has the ability to carry it out. And who God is, who God is, allows him to be in the position to, to do, maybe do this, to make this choice, to, to bring forth this plague. He and he only has this choice. And something we talked about, I believe it's the third week of this series, when we look at God is Yahweh, we talked about this idea that God uh, isn't so much defined by his characteristics, but it really defines them. And so I've heard a lot of people say, well, if he's a God of justice, this doesn't seem just. This isn't real justice. This is just him slaughtering people. This is wrong. But our idea of justice isn't shaped by whatever culture says or what the desire is. Justice is defined by God. We don't get to say, oh, my picture of justice doesn't work with you, God, so therefore you're not a just God. He defines what justice is. And if he says this is a just action, he's the only one who gets to decide that. <laughs> Beyond that, uh, there's this idea that God's desire was ne never to have death. In his perfect creation, when we look at Genesis in the creation story, he brings forth Adam and Eve. He places them in the garden for perfect relationship with him in which there is no death. Death doesn't come until after sin. So death was his secondary. This, this is secondary to what he really truly desired, which was for none to perish, for all to live. It was only because of sin that death entered the world and their judgment is only because of the sin of mankind. And, and, and this idea of like, uh, this is wrong and we don't like it. I, don't, I want to point, I don't think anybody likes this. We see uh, Moses' response. He leaves Pharaoh just mad. He leaves Pharaoh mad and partially I think because he's like, this didn't have to happen. Pharaoh could have turned to God. Egypt could have turned to God and let Israel go. But they didn't. And it's the same thing with God again. His desire wasn't for people to experience death. It was for them to experience life for eternity with him. Lastly, this is a war. This is a war. Israel has been suffering for now for 400 plus years. They have been uh, in slavery, in bondage to pharaohs in Egypt. They have suffered. This is kind of a response to Pharaoh institutes this law where all the males of Egypt, as they're born, are to be put to death. They are at war. The nation of Israel and the nation of Egypt are at war. God is, in essence, their leader. And he's waging kind of this war of defense. Israel is being wronged. And eventually, like all wars do, it leads to death. But I do want to say this is an important question we have to wrestle with. And again, if you want more help processing through this, uh, there are people, pastors at each of your campus who are willing to do so. <coughs> Excuse me. After this plague, Pharaoh, Pharaoh's devastated. He summons Moses and Aaron at night and says, up, go out from among my people, both you and the people of Israel, and go serve the Lord as you have said. Take your flocks and your herds if you have, as you have said and be gone and bless me also. Finally, the 10th plague is finally enough for Pharaoh, who up until this point continued to harden his heart, continued to refuse, but at this point, it's too much for him. He's seen the power of God and he says, go, 
not just go like get out get out go take everything and everyone never be here again and then he says this kind of weird thing bless me also he's waving the white flag your god has continued to curse me and my people uh, no longer <laughs> curse us bless us and unfortunately, as we see, he kind of, he goes back on this once again, but he finally lets e Israel flee Egypt. And the people of Israel journeyed from Ramses to Succoth, about <laughs> 600,000 men on foot, besides women and children. A mixed multitude also went up with them and very much livestock, both flocks and herds. So what happened is finally these people of Israel, they leave and there is just a massive amount. They are truly at this point a nation. There's uh, somewhere around 2 million Israelites, men, women, and children who leave. And besides that, they have this mixed multitude, which is uh, a lot of Egyptians or, or servants of the area. They go with Israel. They are leaving to go to the promised land, to go to the mountain and eventually the promised land. God set out at the beginning of this plagues as we covered last week, his reasoning isn't just the free Israel. It's to make himself unknown amongst the Israelites, but also the Egyptians. And his purpose is being fulfilled. The people of Egypt, the people who worship thousands of Egyptian idols, false gods, see the power of God. They abandon their old ways and they turn to follow the God of Israel, Yahweh. His purpose is being fulfilled. It is working. And it says, all the people of Israel did just as the Lord commanded Moses and Aaron. And on that very day, the Lord brought the people of Israel out of the land of Egypt by their hosts. God has been faithful. 430 years prior, he made a promise that his people would, would be in bondage and then he would free them and he would take them to the promised land, which he is working out. He's in the, the process of doing so. And his promise to Moses, all of his promises about his deliverance has been true. And his people finally get their exodus, their freedom from Egypt. <laughs> and in the midst of all this, you may have noticed we're kind of skipping through. Some of it's just for the length of the passage, but some of it is this back and forth that is presented in chronological order. During the midst of all this, God is handing to Moses and to Israel these festivals. He's instituting festivals, particularly Passover and the Feast of Unleavened Bread. <laughs> He's giving them in there. Uh, as, as the, and they are, they are um, moments, times of remembrance. These two festivals. And they're, they're like intimately connected. You can't, it's really hard to separate them. A lot of them just considered Passover going forward. Uh, they are two separate. And, and they're to continue uh, celebrating these forever going forward. The nation of Israel is to continue celebrating them. Uh, Passover and the Feast of Unleavened Bread. And we're not going to cover all of what it looks like. Really, we want to get to the heart of why do these festivals exist? What is the point of them? Why are they important to us? Because we are Christians, not Jewish. Uh, and why do we need to know about them? What do they really ultimately point to? Now, at the beginning of <laughs> Exodus 12, 2, uh, God's kind of instituting this in this, this passage, he says, this month shall be for you the beginning of months. It shall be the first month of the year for you. What God is doing as nation, as Israel is really becoming a nation, he's, he's really giving them the rhythm of life. He's giving them a new calendar. In fact, he's saying, you're now my people fully as you leave and, and go to my promised land. And you should live different from the people around you. Starting with, you no longer follow the calendar that you used to. This moment forward, this will be the beginning of the year. And this is important. This is important. And what we see from God going forward is he starts to do this. He starts to create this rhythm of life, uh, both the calendar year, but he does it later with Sabbath for the week. And what he's doing is this really cool thing. And I'm not going to spend a really in-depth time because I could really geek out on it. It's really, I love it. But what he's doing is saying, your beginning of your year, the beginning of your week, the beginning you are to start out of worship and celebration of the goodness of God. You are to have rest at the beginning. You are, in essence, to go into the year, to go into the week, starting out of relationship with God. And he says, your year is coming up. You're going to start with these festivals. You're going to celebrate and remember the goodness of God. And out of that, you're going to go into the chaos of the world. The busyness, you're going to start in relationship with, in abiding with God. 
And it's the principle he wants his people to live by. You don't insert God randomly into your schedule, which I think is what a lot of us do. We find these little moments. We get a, a day, an hour at church on Sunday, if we can make it, and maybe a couple things here and there. If I can fit it in in the morning or the evening, reading my Bible, great. But what God wanted was these specific times, again and again and again, that we are with him, prepping us as we go out into the world. And that's what he's doing for Israel right now. He's saying, Passover, the festival of unleavened bread, this should be a moment of remembrance that carries you into everything you're going to do. And then he, there's really two primary principles behind this uh, outside of just this act of worship in, in Passover. The first, <laughs> 1226 to 27, he says, and when your children say to you, what do you mean by this service that is Passover? You shall say, it is the sacrifice of the Lord's Passover. For he passed over the houses of the people of Israel in Egypt when he struck the Egyptians, but spared our houses. <laughs> God is, is saying, here's, here's what this is for. It's for worship, but it is a time of remembrance. He understands the nature of mankind, particularly a nature uh, of, of us marred by sin, is that we are a people who will forget. In the midst of all the chaos of life, the busyness, all the things around us, we will forget God. We will focus on the circumstances of our life and forget the promises, the faithfulness, the history of God and how he has shown who he is and how he will act in our life. And he says, one of the reasons for this, this Passover, this Feast of Unleavened Bread, is so that you, and not just you, but the future generations, remember who I am. That you remember that I am a good and faithful God, that where once you were slaves, I granted you freedom. He wants us to have these moments in our life that are marker moments. And he does this for Israel multiple times with different festivals and, uh, and these <laughs> physical monuments. He, he, he knows that they are necessary parts of our life to look back to God time and time and time again. He wants us to be guided by these things in the midst of our forgetfulness. And really what's cool is next week, uh, family ministries, they're going to be going over this. They're going to kind of dive at a deeper level into this, how this can be used as we disciple our families. And I just want to, I'm super excited. I love this. It's something I've really been wrestling with. What does this look like for my family? Because right now, for and I think for all of us, we have only a couple of real ways in which we remember God, these actual marker moments. We got Easter and Christmas. And Easter is I think we do a great job and Christmas is really hard because we got so much else going around. And then we have communion. We have communion, which is a reminder. We take it once a month. But what we see with Israel is God makes all of these festivals, all of the Sabbaths weekly and all these other monuments. He realizes there needs to be a lot of reminders. And even in the midst of all of these, a lot of reminders for Israel, they forget and what I worry for us and what I, and what I was really on my heart is we don't have a lot of reminders. And if they forgot with a lot of reminders and we only have a few, what's the likelihood of us forgetting? How do we create these marker moments in our family's lives uh, as we disciple our families and our kids? And then the last part really uh, of this significance of Passover, at least the last part that I'm going to cover, is it points to this idea that God is the Redeemer. That's what we see in Passover. We see in the actual event of Passover that God redeems Israel from Egypt. And this word redemption, <coughs> uh, according to the Lexham Bible Dictionary, it is this idea of uh, something purchased in this particular case, um, a, a, a people group, something purchased from bondage uh, at a price. That is this idea of redemption. And so this actual moment, the original Passover, they are being purchased at a price. They are being freed from their bondage to Egypt, partially by this, this uh, atoning sacrifice of the lamb's blood. <coughs> they are being purchased from Egypt at a price, freed from that bondage of slavery. Uh, but it's not just for that. It's actually Passover is painting a picture of what is to come in Jesus Christ and how he as God is the redeemer. He is our redeemer. 
and this, this festival that they have, and they keep it going forward. They c- continue on. They, they practice this sacrifice of a lamb. They actually uh, continue to this until 70 AD when the temple in Jerusalem is destroyed because if there's no temple in Jerusalem, there's to be no sacrifices. They continue this. They choose a lamb, a perfect lamb, or as close to perfect as it can be, and they sacrifice it. And <laughs> they no longer, the, the painting of the door frame with blood is a one-time event. They don't do that going forward. But they're, they're doing that in remembrance of that. But they also, it says they choose a lamb and they do not break its bones. And all of this is pointing to, they don't realize that at the time, it's pointing to Jesus. He comes and he is the perfect sacrificial lamb. And according to the prophecy, none of his bones are broken. So what they're doing is pointing to, they don't even realize that they're pointing to God is just the redeemer there at that moment from Israel. But God is going to be the redeemer for mankind of, from their sins. He is going to pay the cost necessary for us to be purchased from bondage to sin, to Satan, to, to, to death. It's this really cool picture. And, and on top of that, what they do in the midst of it, uh, this Feast of Unleavened Bread, part of what they do is they go into their houses and they clean out all the leaven. And leaven not really something we use right now, a word we use. Uh, it's really any agent that causes dough to rise. So for us, most of the time, that's yeast. They're going through their house, they're cleaning out the leaven, and this is a symbolic gesture. Leaven at the time is, is representative of sin. So they're going throughout their house, cleaning out the sin, <laughs> reminding themselves at the beginning of the year, they are to be a holy people. They are to be set apart. While they live amongst a sinful nation, they are not to be sinful. They are to be God's chosen holy people, set apart from all the rest. And again, pointing to Jesus, he is the one who ultimately cleans us of sin, who, 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 who dies for our salvation. And what's cool for us, we don't celebrate Passover, is this points the way uh, brings about one of our, or, our two ordinances uh, of communion, the Lord's Supper, something we partake in, something you're going to uh, participate in in just a moment. <coughs> and it, it, Jesus, when he goes to become the Redeemer, kind of the, the really the beginning of all the, the events that have been set into motion, he gathers his disciples for the Passover meal. And in that moment, He's going to give us one of our uh, times of remembrance, this communion. And so he sits down with the disciples and he breaks the bread. And it's really cool. I'm not going to get into all the significance of it, but he breaks the bread. And this, is, this isn't just a, he grabs a random piece of bread and he breaks it. This is part of their, uh, of their Passover feast. He breaks the bread. There's three loaves of matzah and he breaks one of them. And, and there's a lot of things that this represents at the time for the Jewish people. Uh, their, their, their three cast, uh, tiers of their caste system, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. But he's breaking it and saying, you've been breaking all these times for all the reasons that you have but it's being broken for something greater than that. The bread that he's breaking, that he gives to the disciples, it's the broken body of Christ. That since this festival has been instituted, he's been pointing, the, God's been pointing the way to, hey, Jesus is going to come and he's going to die for you. He is going to grant you redemption. He is going to be the perfect sacrifice. And so they, they eat the body, the bread, and remember that it's... <laughs> excuse me, that his body is broken. And then he takes the, the wine, the cup, and he says, excuse me, in, in Matthew 26, uh, uh, or, <clears throat> excuse me, 27, he says, he took a cup and when he had given thanks, he gave it to him saying, drink of it, all of you, for this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. I tell you, I will not drink again of this fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new with you in my father's kingdom. And there's a lot of, a lot of ritual that they have around the drinking of the wine and all the cups. Uh, I'm not going to get into that today, but he takes it and he says, you're going to drink this going forward to, because it represents something greater. It represents the, the blood that Jesus is going to spill. That where once you were, you were saved in a sense by the, the blood of the lamb that covers their doorposts, now you will be saved from sin by the blood of Jesus Christ. He will be the perfect atoning sacrifice. God is the redeemer. And so in just a moment, I'm going to release to the campuses. I'm going to release to the campus pastors. They're going to walk you through communion, lead you in communion. 
And I just want, I just want you to take a moment to, to focus on the significance of us. This is one of our times of remembrance that God is in fact our Redeemer. And it's this really cool picture of everything he does. And, and, and sometimes, I'll just be honest with you, communion, leading communion can be really difficult because it's, it feels like there's this, I have to create this moment, this moment. But what we're doing is we're participating in what is already a moment. It is this important time in which we remember that Jesus, Jesus gave of himself. He poured himself out. He lived a perfect life, but was willing to die for us. And it's important and it's beautiful and it's, it, it brings forth sadness and it reminds us the significance of his sacrifice that he gave of himself. The only perfect person, God in the flesh, died for our sins. So in just a moment, you're gonna, I want you to, to just focus and celebrate. Celebrate the goodness of God through communion. I'm going to release now to the campus pastors. I love you guys. Uh, Art Campus, I miss you this weekend, but uh, I'll be honest, I'm having a great, I'm sure I'm having a great time with Jamie celebrating our anniversary, but I can't wait uh, to be back with you guys next week. Love you. Have a great day.